Cecilia and, and Kelly. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll retain some of that, but I, I try to take good notes. But the, my takeaway is that we really need to acquire a lot of knowledge uh, and then keep at these practices uh, to make sure that they work properly. Uh, I'll confess uh, I am not a stream restoration expert. Um, my last project was probably 15 years ago. Um, so I'm really glad that we're going to have uh, Ben from Land Studies to provide his uh, knowledge because uh, he's really a, a, a real legitimate expert on the topic. But my intersection with stream restoration is part of my job is to work with expert panels uh, for the Bay Program to define how much credit you get uh, for sediment and, uh, nutrient reductions associated with uh, stream restoration projects. And so Bill Stack of the Center for Watershed Protection and I uh, facilitated an expert panel of some of the uh, top uh, stream restoration people, not only in the Bay Watershed, but across the country, uh, to do an expert panel to define uh, what the credits were. I kind of want to go over that with you. Uh, if you're a real geek, you know, go download the expert panel report, and it's 100 pages of appendices and so forth. It's up on, on our website. It'll be on the resource website. Okay. Um, but the two kind of takeaways are: uh, it is a very good practice to do in the right place on the right stream in the right way, uh, but. There are some things that you should be aware of uh, because unlike some of the things that we've talked about so far, stream restoration invariably requires multiple permits from the state and federal level. And so you have to understand that it's the right stream, right place, right time. Otherwise, you may not get there. So the outline of my presentation, and I also have to confess that Cecilia and I have to leave at, after the break to go for, to another meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, but we'll go through some of the key definitions, the review of the science that the panel did, I'll go over some of the environmental concerns, discuss the three protocols that are used, some of the specific verification procedures, and I'll conclude with a design example taken from a real project in the District of Columbia floodplain reconnection project. So when we use the term stream restoration, uh, we have to acknowledge it spans a continuum of different things from you know, Elmer dumping a load of riprap down the side of a bank to Lou doing a real sophisticated stream restoration project. Uh, on the panel, there was some agreement that uh, stream restoration would be defined as a project that emphasized either natural channel design, regenerative stormwater conveyance, RSC, or legacy sediment removal, or some hybrid approach of the uh, three that met qualifying conditions, including uh, environmental limitations and stream functional improvement. I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail in a minute big mouthful. Uh, but you know you can start a bar fight real quick by inviting a lot of stream restoration experts and asking them, hey, what's the best way to restore a stream? And the natural channel guys will give you the old Rosgan elbow and legacy seven folks will whack you upside the head and so forth. But they were all represented on the panel and we all uh, asked them to behave well and mostly they did. And part of the agreement was that no matter what design approach you, you take to stream restoration, um, you can, the project can fail if it's inappropriately located, if you didn't do your uh, pre-assessment work, or poor, poor design, poor construction, or even poor maintenance. So uh, we'll get back to that in a bit. But, but in terms of, if you're not really an expert in the three approaches, I'll briefly uh, to give the definition that the panel did. And so natural channel design is probably the oldest form of stream restoration. It's 
pioneered by Dave Roskin and it uses uh, the application of fluvial geomorphology to create stable channels in a state of dynamic equilibrium among water sediment and vegetation such that they're stable. And by that, they don't degrade, build up, or degrade over time. And so they're designed for some stability, and there's a stream classification system, uh, and various things are used. Uh, and so typically, when you do these kind of projects, uh, you have to collect a lot of data on the current morphology of the channel, including its cross-section, plan form, um, the pattern, profile, and sediment characteristics. And again, um, this is a series of uh, books and manuals by Dave Roskin from Colorado on, on his method, and he had, offers various levels of training depending on where you are in the Bay Watershed, I'd say most projects are currently natural channel design. Uh, and part of that is a built-in, uh, it's like once you go through a certain level of training, uh, for, for, for example, Maryland State Highway or Virginia State Highway, you get, actually have to show that you have this training to practice stream restoration, which is a little weird. Uh, Pennsylvania, though, has been doing a lot of work with legacy sediment removal projects. And these photos are from the Big Spring project, which is, uh, there's been quite a few that have been implemented, but this one has been intensively sampled for five or six years since it was constructed. And first of all, let me define legacy sediments if you're not familiar with them. Basically, legacy sediments are simply uh, in the colonial period, we had two things that occurred in our stream corridors palatious amounts of uh, erosion, and we also had mill dams. And so the erosion got trapped behind those mill dams, and there were hundreds of mill dams during that water power era. And so that kind of built up a layer, uh, in some cases several meters deep, of trapped sediments that exist there to this day. So now we have urbanization or more um, uh, land development is cutting through those older sediments, which are less cohesive creating a lot of sediment. So in this approach, we remove those legacy sediments from the floodplain. Uh, it's very nicely illustrated in this. This is the, uh, uh, <coughs> after the uh, sediment's been removed, and you can see there's a multiple thread channel going back and forth. Um, and then when you get a big storm event, it spreads out nicely over the channel. And so there's one of the big, area of disagreement is if you were in this watershed 300 years ago, what would those streams really look like? Would they look like what we're seeing now with this geometry, single thread, forested banks, or would they be this kind of uh, you know, strong beaver ponds, sedges, tussocks, and so forth? And the scientific evidence suggests that that's actually probably what you would have seen. The question is, can we put the genie back in the bottle after all the land development has happened? So uh, that's legacy sediment removal. And then the third entrant into the competition is something called regenerative stormwater conveyance. I think Brian Seif showed a couple slides. It comes in two flavors. Flavor one is dry channels or gullies. The second flavor is wet channel. So we've all seen this quite a bit, these incredible gullies, particularly below storm drain outfalls, in between the outfall and the stream corridor, prodigious loadings of sediment that basically uh, was pioneered in Anne Arundel County, Maryland, where we fill in those gullies with a series of boulder wedges uh, and then a mix of sand and wood chips and so we have step pools going down slope that not only accept and protect it from further erosion, but they um, increases the local groundwater and stabilizes them. So uh, the wet channel ones are further down the stream network. They use in-stream weirs to raise the water into the floodplain for uh, smaller uh, levels of the stream. So if you had like a half inch or a quarter inch storm, it, it would still um, 
driving into the floodplain. So it's kind of a hybrid, um, hybrid approach. So very quickly, I'll, I'll tell you what the panel did. Um, the panel said those drive channel applications, that's actually covered by another expert panel report that we talked about uh, yesterday, which is the retrofit expert panel. And they laid out the conditions and how that was done. So that was a classic case of punting uh, from one panel to another. Scientists like to punt sometimes. Uh, but in terms of wet channel applications, which can be fairly controversial because it's a relatively new form of stream restoration, the regulators and permitters have seen failures, they've seen successes, they're not sure how to deal. The wet channel versions um, are considered in this expert panel report. So um, some of the qualifying conditions that if you're considering a project, if you're just sitting there trying to protect a sewer line from bank erosion um, and you're just armoring that one place, the panel said that's you know, probably important to do, but you can't get credit for nutrient percent reduction from that. And also, if your project is kind of tiny, it's like 100 feet or less of the stream reach, sorry, um, you don't get credit for that. But it needs to be a serious project of, of several hundred feet uh, with the intention of dealing with a, a comprehensive approach involving both the channel and the banks in the stream corridor. And a special consideration uh, is given to projects that reconnect the stream to its floodplain or create wetlands or in-stream habitat that <coughs> promote nutrient uptake and denitrification. So it's kind of a, a long-winded way of saying that you don't get credit just for working in the stream. You have to show that the project is... Uh, so in terms of the review of the science, we started out with the old rate, and we were, uh, Ben and I were talking about this earlier, about sometimes you, uh, when, the, when panels form, they go, well, where's the science behind it? So this was actually studied years ago, and they had precisely one study to base their estimate on. Uh, and so based on that, they came up with uh, these removal rates per linear foot of stream restoration project which I'll just tell you are, are very, very low. And so immediately, like if you were investing in stream restoration stock, sell, sell, sell. <laughs> um, but then what's kind of funny is uh, the study, this was based on three years of data. He kept on uh, studying more years, Steve Stewart in Baltimore County, and he concluded that the uh, rates were, uh, were higher over time that the project became more effective as time went on and pretty decent removal through the reach. But again, it's still just one study. And so uh, the panel got together, they looked at six additional studies. Uh, I think Beaver Run and Beaver Dam Creek were located in Pennsylvania. The other ones were in uh, Maryland and they averaged them all together, and I'll show you even a larger population they used. And the, the rates, I, I will show them compared to the original ones, but they all much higher by an order of magnitude. So then if you had sold your stream restoration stocks, you would have been in trouble, because now it brought it back up as a uh, rate. So I'll just say, for those of you who don't want to deal a lot with calculations, these are generally the numbers that are used uh, if you're assessing your project and say, okay, it's about 1,000 feet of stream restoration. You just want a quick estimate of what your reduction is. Just multiply out the length of the project by these rates, and that is what the rate you can get if you don't want to go through the complexity of these calculations. Tom? Are those rates um, based on the couple few years after the project has been installed, or do you get credit for 
the year after installation or five years after installation? You get credit uh, once the project is accepted as being stabilized and uh, is accepted by the regulatory agency. Okay. So you get it pretty much right away. So does that mean that you that, that the credit you would get would be the equivalent of what it would be at maturity? Um, yes. Okay. Um, and essentially what the panel felt is even though they were conservative in, in, in how they derive a number, realizing they probably do get better over time like good bourbon, but they basically said you get this much right now. And, and so this is the stream bank erosion rates uh, based on a subsequent literature review in terms of pounds per feet per year, a much wider group. This was the initial credit, that low one I showed you, where we sold on. And this is the new one, so it kind of gets to your thing. They, they were conservative. They could have taken it, you know, a higher, a little bit higher number, but uh, that was the sediment reduction credit. And I think the only good thing to say is that we went from one study you know, to many more studies. So we're beginning to understand um, the sediment dynamics. And it's a very important thing too, um, where the sediment is coming from. There's been some great research, including a paper by uh, Donovan uh, in Baltimore County of 25 watersheds. And finally about 70% of the streams are 70% uh, of the annual sediment budget from a stream like that is coming from stream bank erosion. Most of it's occurring in the first and second water streams, and about half of the erosion are legacy sediment. So we're getting a lot more studies that are saying when it comes to things like sediment, where you know it's not washing off the paper as much. I mean there is some. It might be eroding off some of our lawns, but not a lot. We sort of get a lot from our construction site. But the majority of sediment, at least, is coming from the um, stream bank erosion. And so that's why stream bank erosion is a, is a good strategy for stream bank restoration. And in terms of how they're simulated in the watershed model, the watershed model does not simulate um, headwater streams. But it basically says if your watershed has a high percentage of impervious cover, the sediment loading rate will increase proportionately, and they actually had a fair amount of good watershed data uh, by Langland and Cronin to establish that relationship. So uh, again, it's just more confirmation that uh, the impervious cover may not produce the uh, sediment itself, but it's producing that runoff that's like a fire hose in the channel that's accelerating the rate of stream bank erosion further downstream, if that makes sense. The other kind of insider issue that makes it a lot of concern for people this far up in the watershed is the watershed model uses a sediment delivery ratio. And basically what that says is uh, in my headwater streams, almost all the sediment I'm producing uh, is getting to the, the sediment. But as I'm going further down, you know, here's 100 square miles, 1,000 square miles. This might be the drainage area all the way down to Conowingo from here. Um, we're getting less than about 80 percent of the sediment is not that's generated stream bank erosion here it is not getting to the bay watershed. So it's kind of a discount on your sediment reduction. It's very frustrating to be this far up in the watershed and you realize, okay, I just calculated for this project that um, I'm getting 50 tons of sediment reduction, but in terms of the bay TMDL, they're counting it as only 20% of that. Does that make sense? So many other Having said that, one of the reasons why 
stream restoration is a popular practice is um, because the direct local benefits that you have, I mean, you have a, a TMDL for sediment for the, is it the Juniata? Is it correct? The lower Juniata? Juniata. Juniata. So just to make sure, Tom, that I'm understanding that in layman's terms, just in case anybody else is wondering, what you're saying there is, from this chart is, those of us up in the headwaters will get a, a lower rate. Uh, First time. In other words, if we do the same project here versus down in Conewago Township, they're going to get more credit because their impact is... They're closer to the bank. Clo they're closer, so they're going to get more credit for doing something, the same amount of force. For sediment. Nutrients, because they're often found in soluble forms, do not have the same sediment delivery. So if you get 10 pounds here, those pounds are counted as if they're getting all the way down to the Chesapeake Bay. I know it's kind of, and you, I was talking about bar fights earlier really, when it comes to modeling. Mm -hmm. That's like uh, riots that we have. Yeah, because you would make the argument that it's not 20% of our sediment that's going down there. If you're sampling in these waters, you can make the argument that we're seeing the stuff that's going to out within miles of what we're seeing show up. So, well, there is actually, a Data. <laughs> All right. I've obviously picked a scab here. <laughs> I put that band-aid right back on it. No, but that's on. important because when we try to sell it locally, it's good for us to understand what what that translates into. So, thank and, you. and the other thing to keep in mind is streams have floodplains, and floodplains get bigger the further you go down, right? And those floodplains, what are their? What are, they have a lot of great values, but one of their biggest values is when you get floods into the floodplain, they trap sediment. So, uh, and, and what I should say is this is like the real time sediment delivery for in the church of what's happening now. Um, those sediments that are trapped in the floodplain will get to the bay, but it might take them hundreds or even a thousand years to get there. So from a management standpoint, we can't be that patient if we're trying to clean up the clarity of the water. Um, there's a, kind of an abundant literature that shows that when you restore streams, they have greater ability to process uh, nitrogen and, and in some cases create denitrification. So I won't go through all the papers that they did, but I just want to give you some of the theory and science um, about you know, streams are not pipes. They're, they have a floodplain, they have a hyper zone, which is a fancy Latin term for it's the water below the bottom of the stream. And that zone is a very, it's a hidden one. I, mean, I think they didn't even realize it existed until about 1980. Uh, but um, they found as we increase the retention time, the flood waters in the wetlands, where we had dissolved organic carbon and woody debris, where we had carbon sources, things like debris jams, woody debris, uh, that carbon is an essential co-ingredient to create denitrification. That streams that were connected to the floodplain uh, had higher rates of nitrogen processing. We saw some wonderful shots a little bit earlier about the cornfields and stream banks, and those were disconnected from the sediments. They're not, the floodwaters never really go over the top. Um, so there were a no, number of other factors that they did. And I'm going to skip over to the next level of environmental concern. Um, and this was and I apologize for the density of the text, but there is, we've been regulating the stream corridor for about 30 years now, uh, and every every project you do in the stream requires, as you know, a 404 and 401 permit, and those permits uh, are not automatic. And so the panel said stream restoration should be a 
carefully designed intervention to improve the hydrologic, geomorphic, water quality, and biological condition of degraded urban streams. It should not be implemented for the sole purpose of nutrient and sediment reduction. That's a very important statement to get fully around that we're doing this to bring the entire stream up, not just to put a little wastewater treatment plant in the middle of the stream. that it really influences where and when we do stream restoration. It would be the height of folly to go to a stream in good condition and restore it to get nutrient reduction when it's already performing good functions and we're taking a risk of, we're playing God with nature, quite honestly, at that point. So there are a, a class of streams that are degraded, in bad shape, bring them back up through stream restoration, and that's where we do it. So generally, stream restoration is only warranted in urban reaches that are degraded now or in the past by upstream watershed development. There's a few, a few classes of legacy sediment projects that don't follow that uh, definition. Um, you know, that it's okay to do legacy sediment projects in non-urban areas, because there the impact occurred 200 years ago. So it's a legitimate approach. So in general, um, if you're hiring a good consultant like Land Studies, you'd want to ask them um, to meet some presumptive uh, criteria about where you're proposing stream restoration. Uh, for example, you want some geomorphic evidence of active uh, stream degradation. You want an index of biotic integrity of fair or worse. So like if, if you go into the stream and you're seeing stone flies and caddis flies and elder mites and stuff like that, you know, it's a big red light that you should be messing around with any kind of stream restoration. But if you're just seeing a bunch of uh, If you're not seeing any life, then it's okay. You want to have some evidence of floodplain disconnection. Again, Kelly showed you those shots of the cornfield and the stream, and there was that um, big gap where it's cut down well below. So in many cases, it will never get over the banks. The floodplain is no longer functionally connected. Or evidence of significant depth of legacy sediment in the project reach. And, um, Ben, that's kind of a, a different color, or how, how do you identify legacy sediments if you have a big cut? Um, it's usually monitor in the flow of material, so you don't see rocks in there. You can use it to the sediments. There's, there's tell tell stuff with uh, very organic material at the bottom. You can see flaws in it, 200 years old. Uh, these packs at the bottom. Yeah, it's like a two layer thing. You see this like organic darker layers sometimes, and above it is like these normal sort of cohesive sediments. And so the organic matter was where the stream used to be, and everything above it are the legacy sediments. Of course, you need a bar fight about showing exactly where that is. Um, so those are the conditions. The other is um, we're wanting to reduce stream impairment, and so we want to improve functional uplift, and I'll describe that one in a little bit more detail. All projects must meet the permit requirements. Um, all projects need to compensate for any project-related tree loss, so that if I'm doing the project out here and need access to the stream, I'm taking down all the trees. You know, how good is that in terms of the watershed payoff? If I'm taking down trees, I have to show that I'm putting them back. And uh, there has to be an authority, a conservation district, or somebody who's willing to take ownership of the practice, including maintenance of the time. So it's not like you can do stream restoration and walk away from it. Just like you can't, as I learned this morning, I can't do um, riparian planting. And the other thing that's kind of informal is the regulatory authorities want to make sure you at least look at the upland areas that 
a good project, may involve stream restoration, but there's some attempt in the upland areas to use additional practices to control it. And that's kind of an unwritten permitting rule that if you're just coming in with a straight stream restoration project without any, any upstream retrofits or tree planting or things like that, you, you're probably going to ask me about that. They may not withhold the permit, but, well, they probably will for like six or nine months ago, a bunch of meetings and <coughs> delayed. So again, showing that comprehensive approach, and this is exactly what they tell us in watershed management, that you know, if we want to bring a watershed back, you can't just focus on one part of the watershed. We need to look at it as a whole and combine the stream restoration with upland projects. But the panel also said, as of 2014 or whenever they were finished up, what we really don't know, well, I'd love to know it, but we really don't know, is uh, what's the right proportion of upland stuff to stream restoration? And it's a really good, uh, like if you're more, if you urbanize in Altoona in the next 20 years, how much of the runoff reduction and LID practices do you need to prevent downstream bank erosion caused by all that? And I think it's one of the most un, the biggest unknowns that we have in both the stormwater profession and the watershed one. I wish I could tell you more. But, So, let's talk about the protocols real quickly. Um, there are three protocols that you can use to compute your credit. There's one for prevented sediment, and that basically says how much uh, sediment did you prevent from eroding by your project. The next was for in-stream denitrification uh, below the stream, in, in some cases to the side. How well have you your project reconnected to the floodplain. As I mentioned, they took dry channel, regenerative stormwater conveyance, and punted it over to the um, retrofit panel. So this is a summary um, for prevented sediment. It's for both sediment and nutrients. Uh, you get pounds per year. Uh, you, it's defined using the banks method, which I'll describe few minutes um, and you essentially determine how much sediment did you prevent and then you multiply it by the nutrient content of floodplain sediments. The second is on in-stream denitrification as you might ex uh, see it's for total nitrogen only. So you have to define a given quantity called the hyperreic box and then it's multiplied by a measured unit stream denitrification rate. And the third one is storm floodplain reconnection. There's a series of curves that applies to all three pollutants. And uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of that. So just a little bit more detail for the first one. It's the annual mass of nutrient and sediment for a qualified project that would otherwise be delivered from the actively enlarging the size of the stream. So you estimate the existing sediment erosion rates uh, that are using the Banks method. Uh, you convert the erosion rates to nitrogen phosphorus loads, and then they're discounted by 50%, which is, again, the panel just wanted to be conservative. And so uh, the Dave Roskin came up with a method to look at the bank erosion potential uh, based on a couple of index, the uh, B high curves and there's another curve uh, near bank stress indices. And based on those, there's a, uh, you can compute in the field the risk of uh, loss. The second protocol deals with uh, the hyperreic box. You get the entire stream channel plus five feet in either side plus down five feet. Uh, so that's your box. You multiply it by the length of your project. You multiply that by a unit denitrification rate. That was based on stream monitoring and a series of streams in the watershed. And um, you have like bedrock outcrops 
your box gets smaller. But uh, and then in terms of floodplain reef connection, essentially this is something you see a lot with legacy sediment projects in this area. Uh, you, I think it's easier to see from the curves. As you're getting more channel flow and treating it in the floodplain, uh, you get credit for that uh, using a series of curves. Uh, in terms of verification procedures, um, you have to do two things to finally come home with the credit. The first is uh, you need to, the installing agency needs to certify that the project was installed properly, meets or exceeds its functional restoration objectives, and is hydraulically and vegetatively stable. So that might mean there's a, as much as a growing season or a year until you know, after construction when you're able to get the credit. So the designer or local inspector would certify that. So that's your first. Then you get the credit for five years, uh, at which time you have to go out and uh, do a field inspection to verify that the project has not been washed away by a flood, uh, that it's still adequately maintained and it's operating as originally designed. So if that inspection says, hey, it's still looking good, you get five more years. And you keep on renewing and renewing and renewing based on that. But if you don't do the inspection after five years, or if the inspection indicates the project has failed, you lose the credit, um, and you can renew it by fixing it uh, or lose it. So it's a strong incentive for folks to stay with it. Again, it's a theme that we talked about yesterday with by retention design, uh, today about stream buffer plantings, that um, the act of original installation is important, but we have to maintain the practice and verify that it's still working as designed. Um, so what you report to the state, uh, type, length, and width of the project, the location coordinates, the year you installed it, and that's it, so that they know in five years where have you inspected it, which of the three protocols you used, you can use more than one, and then uh, you might want to check with the EP going forward whether they want additional information or not. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about stream functional assessment um, because this is the, what the panel came up with uh, about trying to figure out are we doing more than just improving uh, nitrogen removal. And so the basic concept that was proposed um, is it's like a pyramid. That the first thing we do with the streams, we try to improve the hydrology as it, the transport of water from the watershed <coughs> to the channel. Uh, and then we try to improve the hydraulic characteristics of the stream so that it can make it stable over time and not erode, which leads to better uh, geomorphology. The geomorphology and uh, riparian cover then improve the temperature and oxygen conditions of the stream, um, provides more organic matter, sequesters more nutrients. And then hopefully when we've improved the first four levels, we go to the top and we produce some kind of improvement in the biological um, quality of that stream. So that, let's say there were three fish species before we started, now we might have six. And you know, the panel was very realistic. He said, well, we're getting better and better at these first three levels. And we can't always say that we're going to um, prove that we're doing a biological uplift, but that should be our goal, and those are the things that we should measure, so that five years from now, if we're getting stuck here and not getting to here, that it will inform very much about uh, our conservatism towards stream restoration. And the, uh, 
issue that's going on now is uh, Harmon and some others uh, put together a more quantitative approach to that pyramid, uh, a way of designing the project to look at stream functions. Um, I think they did a good job, but they all came from the natural channel design school, and so they're now amending their methods to apply to legacy sediment projects, and they're working with the regulatory communities just issued a report, I think, last month on it. And um, so hopefully there'll be some of those tools to look at functional. But are they doing like, benefit surveys before and after some of this stuff? Are they actually doing the uh, cross-section of what's living in the stream? Yeah, it's funny. With most stream restoration work, you do a lot of uh, channel cross-sections before you start, a lot of plan form work. There's quite a bit of pre-work. But you don't always do fish and bug work. And I think that's the point of um, what the panel was saying is, you know, how can we tell if the bugs and fish are getting better if you didn't me measure the bugs and fish before you got started? And I think that's a good question to ask. But traditionally, you know, it's more oriented on geomorphic indicators of stream. All right, so here's a quick design example. Uh, it's from a project that, so sorry, did this one above or come close to living up? <laughs> so this is a loser project? It was not submitted. <laughs> it's not a loser, which is fine. This is actually Nash Run in the uh, District of Columbia. This can't be a picture of Nash Run, though. No. So this is a simulated picture of what Nash Run looked like. It's much more urban than that. Um, this was kind of a, they didn't call it legacy sediment removal, but uh, they created a low flow, a low floodplain bench in relation to the current stream elevation, a highly urban stream. They removed about 10,000 cubic yards of stream bank or, or soils, and they created a six foot Flood plain on both sides of the stream. It should be feet, yeah. And it's uh, created more connection than had existed uh, beforehand. So, really, hammered urban stream. And like a lot of stream restoration projects, you don't have nearly the room that you had in rural areas to play with. It's property lines, homeowners, and so forth. So, this is actually what it looked like. Uh, this is one section prior. And so, here are the sediments they removed. So Tom, on the right-hand side, that's all residential yards. So they couldn't go that direction. You can see the fence right here. Right. And then there's the homeowners and pretty tight boundaries. So they didn't have a lot to work in. So in this case, they kind of took it all out, did some grain controls. And in this case, because they were working so tight, they had irrigated riprap on one side there wouldn't be any stream bank erosion. But the net effect was there was more floodplain to work with across the stream. So they actually used all three protocols. They found that two of them actually gave them some results. They did a fair amount of monitoring using bank pins and soil testing uh, over a, a segment. and. Uh, to show how it works, this is not really polite to show calculations after lunch, but they had the length of the project, um, they computed, um, the total project length was 1,300 feet, uh, about 350 feet was um, considered to be prevented sediment, they did their calculations, um, from the actual existing monitoring data based on the, the bank pins. They multiplied it by what the panel numbers for uh, pounds per ton and multiplied it by the conversion of 50% efficiency and um, about 300 pounds of nitrogen, 95 pounds of phosphorus, 123 tons a year of sediment. So those are some <coughs> In general, prevented sediment of the three protocols gives you the biggest numbers. And just to put it in perspective, if you remember Brian's site, 
doing his calculations yesterday for all those retrofits. Even that big one that was the pond, that was about you know, 30 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus. I don't remember the exact numbers. But you can see in comparison, stream restoration you know, for the right projects in the right place really does give you a lot. So this is the protocol one. Protocol two is a um, hyper box. The channel width wasn't very big, but they added five feet to both sides, five feet down. So this is the volume of the hyper box over its length multiplied by you get to cubic yards, cubic yards to tons, <laughs> retiring, times the unit unification rate, we can go, and so they got about an additional 200 pounds of nitrogen per year. So Tom, what does that translate into credits? So all that calculation, we got the pounds of nitrogen per, per year, but in terms of credits, like what does that, to the politicians, what does that mean? What it means is for this project, uh, for total nitrogen, they were able to get between protocol one and protocol two, 523 pounds per year of credit uh, from their allocation. So it's pretty good. And then about 100 pounds for phosphorus and however many tons that comes out to be. So uh, in the Bay Pollution Dial, what we're measuring is the pounds you lose and not the rate at which you lose the pounds, if that makes any sense. So if I lose 10 pounds of nitrogen, that's great. Uh, but we often confuse the removal rates that we talked about yesterday with efficiencies uh, with what the bean counters in Annapolis Harrisburg, you're looking at pounds reduced from the launch. So, Tom, just to be clear, we have waste load allocations for TMDLs, and we'll be able to subtract those numbers directly on of our yearly waste load allocations. Correct. Uh, with the exception of you would submit your sediment numbers, which is reduced by 84. And then it would go into the, the Wizard of Oz, and you have the curtain entities, and you have 